Some of you may remember a couple of weeks ago during the sermon, the computer locked up and I wasn't able to advance the PowerPoint slides. Yeah. You remember that, okay, yeah. I tried a few different things, what I could do in desperation up here. Eventually I asked someone if someone in the congregation would be able to fix the problem. Fortunately, Mark Delacroce was here to save the day and he came and he took the computer and he was able to reset the machine shutting down all the operations and starting over completely from the beginning. Now, many of you who have technical problems with any number of devices that you have, it's computers, cell phones, microwaves, when you encounter those kinds of operational problems, very often you, you try to find out what, what you need to do. You might call their customer service line or go online to, to see how you do it. The first thing they almost always will tell you to do is to shut it down, reboot, and restart whatever it is that you're having problems with. We see that this is what God did with mankind in the flood. It was this enormous reset that he did. In Genesis 6, we read that since the world had gotten so bad and mankind had become so corrupt that it was necessary for God to reset mankind and start all over again. Just like with technology, however, in many cases, the restart gets the apparatus functioning again, but does not ensure that similar problems are not going to happen in the future. The same set of software instructions that caused the problem to arise in the first place might reappear in the future. And this likewise was the case with mankind. The situation before the flood had become so intolerable, it was so bad that mankind may have even lost the opportunity for redemption if God had not intervened because of the situation between the sons of God and the daughters of men that it had it, it spread throughout the entire human race, the possibility or the, th that there would be um, redemption through the seed of the woman would have been eliminated. So it was necessary that God had to reset the ma mankind and give humans another opportunity. But as we will see, mankind still had a sinful nature and the same flaws that created the situation in the first place before the flood also existed after the flood. The flood represented a new starting point for mankind. It also represented major changes both in the natural world and in mankind's relationship to one another. However, as I hope uh, to point out I believe it did not represent a significant or major or dramatic shift in how mankind and God related to one another. This message will consider the aftermath of the flood and some of the dramatic changes that took place as mankind began to rebuild and establish itself once again. I'm going to make some comments here that those of you that have studied this in the past and have, have come to various conclusions, you may disagree with me. And that's fine. That, it's, it's, it's fine if you have a different opinion. I just want you to engage in the material and consider it, uh, look at it critically, and I, I would rather have you disagree than to ignore it completely or to fall asleep. At least I know when somebody comes and says after the service, you know, I just didn't like what you said, Pastor. I appreciate that because I know you weren't sleeping. So that's always encouraging. So as soon as Noah came out of the ark after the floodwaters of judgment had receded, he offered God a sacrifice of those animals which God considered clean. We read and talked about that last week. God then made a covenant with Noah about, about life with humans or life for humans after the flood. Now this covenant is particularly important for us because it established much of the relationship that we would have with nature, with other animals, and with one another from that point forward, including our lives today. The first thing mentioned is God's promise never to destroy mankind or the earth again through a flood. Now there will be a future judgment of mankind where the world will become as evil and depraved as it was before the days of the flood and that will be in the tribulation before the, the return of Christ. That destruction, however, when God judges the world at that time, will be with fire and with war. It will not be through floodwaters as he did the first time. It will be a purification of the earth in preparation for the coming of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the establishment of his kingdom here on earth. However, such a massive and universal destruction will not take place prior to the second coming of the Lord. 
In the meantime, God is showing his mercy to mankind, and even though we deserve to be punished in that same way, he is not going to do it. He is withholding his judgment at this time, and he is, he is working with us and expressing himself through his grace and his mercy. The covenant that God established with Noah is often associated with a new dispensation that is called human government. And I just want to do a little bit of review. We talked about this a few weeks ago. I'm going to review it again. Uh, for those of you uh, that uh, may not be familiar with the idea, a dispensation is a set of principles which govern God's dealing with man. They are the rules which God has established to define his expectations for mankind's behavior. The rules of the various dispensations are the requirements which demonstrate the sincerity of one's faith by obedience to God's command for that particular administration of his will. Dispensations are revealed in time and cover periods of time, but a dispensation per se is not a span of time. Rather, it is an economy. It is a series of expectations that God has, or some translations will say an administration. There's a tendency to think of dispensations as periods of time. Schofield in the Schofield Bible defines actually a dispensation as a period of time, but it really isn't. The literal translation is house rules, the rules of the house, the rules of the economy, so to speak, of, uh, of that particular period that God is working in. A dispensation primarily has to do with the expectations of God for those who claim faith in him and the way that that faith is demonstrated to be genuine. Now, many things changed on the earth after the flood. The Noahic covenant involved a promise from God that changed the expectations between mankind and nature and between man and man. Yet, as I see it, there is not a fundamental difference after the flood with the way God and man related to one another, that, that there was not a significant difference. Unlike the dramatic changes that take place in the other dispensations, obviously between innocence when before, uh, before man had sinned and conscience after, after the, the curse on mankind, there, that was a dramatic difference in how man and God related to one another, or the promise that God gave when he called Abram and that he and his, his offspring alone would be the channel through whom God's blessings would flow to all of mankind. Or with Moses when God revealed 600 laws to the nation of Israel that they were to obey in order to receive the material blessings of God. The next dramatic shift in God's dealing with mankind was after Israel's rejection of their promised Messiah, Jesus Christ, and God opened the way of salvation to all people regardless of Israel's lack of faith. And that by grace through faith, a person could become a member of the body of Christ. That, of course, is the dispensation that we live in today, the dispensation of grace. Finally, we see the picture of, time, of the time when Israel will be restored as the vessel of God's blessing, and all the world will worship before the throne of Jesus the Messiah in the earthly kingdom. So these are the various dispensations that are outlined, clearly outlined in the scriptures. As I said, I do not see what happened with Noah as being a, a great difference in terms of how God and man related to one another. And so I personally, even though most of, uh, most like your Schofield Bible and many of the other dispensational sources will say that a new dispensation took place here, started with after the flood with Noah, called human government, um, I personally don't see that. Uh, and as I said, you can disagree with me if you, if you choose, uh, but uh, I just can't see a, greater, a great significance in how God and man were, were dealing with one another or how God, what God expected between uh, him, him and mankind. Each of those great changes represented a significant shift in the way that a person's faith is expressed, and thus each of them all brought in a new dispensation. And as I said, I do not see that change taking place before the flood and after the flood. God gave instructions to Noah and to his family to multiply and to fill the earth, the same instructions that he gave to Adam. And though I personally do not see a dispensational change, however, the Noahic covenant and the commands which God gave after the flood are significant and are of great importance for us today as followers of God. The sign of God's promise was the rainbow. And each time we see a rainbow today, we are reminded of God's goodness, 
his long suffering, his promise never to destroy the world again. That was read in the scripture passage, which we read earlier today. And then we see that there were great and dramatic changes that took place in nature after the flood. Peter tells us that the world that existed before the flood perished, not that it was destroyed and ceased to exist, but rather it was changed to the point that it became unrecognizable. The flood brought dramatic changes to the world, both physically and in terms of mankind's relationship to the earth and to the animal world. Immediately after the flood, we read about the promise of the rainbow in the sky to remind mankind of God's grace in not bringing about universal destruction and judgment through a flood ever again. Now this, of course, raises the questions of, well, was there a rainbow before the flood? Did God change the laws of physics after the flood so that now light would reflect, refract through the droplets of, of water and separating the wavelengths of light and creating the various colors that we see in the sky causing the rainbow. It's possible. It's possible that God made that, that physical change in how things happen. However, I think it's more likely we read earlier in Genesis that there was a, a vapor covering of the atmosphere at the time before the flood. And that direct sunlight was probably not coming through. Everything was, was clouded by this vapor that, that existed. And therefore, there wasn't a rainbow. After the flood, that changed. That vapor canopy was lost. We've talked about that in the past in some of the previous messages. And now it was possible for sunlight to directly come to the earth. And so when you had the conditions that create a rainbow, they were visible for the first time where they had not been prior to the flood. And so I don't think that God changed the physics after the flood as much as he simply changed the circumstances of, of how sunlight made it to the earth. But whatever the case was, we do know that the rainbow became that symbol of God's mercy and his grace and his long-suffering for mankind. Then the vapor canopy may have also caused the climate to be more uniform throughout the earth. And you wouldn't have had the extremes in hot and cold. You wouldn't have had the poles uh, where you, had, you know, have uh, cold in the north and in the, in the extreme south. And so you see this, pro this promise in Genesis 8.22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. Like the rainbow, the changes in the season we're a reminder of God's care for the earth which he created. And we're reminded every time that year and the seasons change, especially this time of year. Now, up till uh, Saturday, I kind of thought, well, maybe God forgot this year. And he wasn't going to bring in winter. But no, there was a dramatic change. And, and we can see that God did remember. And he's going to fulfill these promises just as he gave them in Genesis chapter 8. The regularity of the seasons shouts of the faithfulness of God and that he does not change and he keeps his word just as he promised and we can always trust that. Then it also says here in Genesis chapter 9 that um, God put fear, the fear of mankind into the animals. Now most commentators attribute that shift in the relationship between man and animals to the fact that God now permitted man to eat all kinds of animals. And so, since the animals now were going to become a potential supper for any man, it was a way of protecting them from, from what could happen if they encountered a man. And, then, and it also created a new challenge for mankind if he wished to eat. It made it a little bit more difficult. Now, I'm not quite so sure that's the case. That's what most of the commentaries that I read said about it. It was to protect the animals. But I actually feel that the fear of man placed in the animals was more for the protection of man than it was for the animals. Imagine if, any, if every animal that was capable of harming humans did so. Now, for the most part, most animals, even the most ferocious ones, avoid contact with human beings unless they're in a position where either they're mad animals or that they're... Um, they're trapped or they're protecting their young or they're in some unusual circumstance, generally wild animals simply avoid humans. They don't want to have any contact with them. They're afraid of them. And so what that's doing is it's actually a protection against us as human beings. It was God protecting us because if those animals 
weren't afraid of us, and they were to attack us every time they encountered us, we'd be in an awfully difficult position. Imagine that if uh, what it would be like if every wolf, bear, cougar, lion, snake, coyote, tiger, or even Great Dane would aggressively seek humans and attack them. The fact is, without a weapon, something that we are able to make, we are dreadfully vulnerable, and we would be wiped out by all of these animals if God had not put that fear in them. So whether God put the fear to protect the animals from us or put the fear in them so that they would avoid us and not, and not directly attack us, one way or another, we do know that this characteristic of the relationship between man and animals changed dramatically after the flood. And then we see that there was a dramatic change in diet. Another important change that took place was that God gave mankind the permission to eat any type of meat. So prior to that, of course, mankind was given all the fruit and vegetables that God had created, that, that was, he was free to eat that. But here we see a change. So in Genesis 1.29, and God said, I see I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to you it shall be for food. Now here in Genesis chapter 9, he says, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs, but you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. And then, of course, we know that later on in, in Leviticus, God once again changed that requirement, and for the Israelites, he gave them, a specific, gave them specific guidelines as to which types of food they were able to eat. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, These are the animals which you may eat among all the animals that are on the earth. Among the animals, whatever divides the hoof, having cloven hooves and chewing the cud, you may eat. So in the book of Leviticus, we read how God restricted the diet of his people Israel, and they were, had certain foods that were permissible to eat, such as beef, sheep, goat, and fish with scales. Other food was unclean and not permitted for the Jews to eat, such as pork, shellfish, or dairy, that dairy and meat together. They were forbidden to eat those kinds of things. Now, furthermore, we see a change that takes place for the body of Christ, in which God gives instructions that we are free to eat of any food that we choose. 1 Timothy 4.4, 4, For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. So these differences in dietary regulations are one of the clearest examples that God has different expectations and requirements for people in different ages. It is an example of what can be referred to as vertical truth. Rules that God has given to men that apply in certain dispensations and not in others. Now the one stipulation that God put on Noah was that he should not eat food that still had blood in it. He was not to eat the blood. He stated that the life of the creature is in the blood, and it was forbidden from him for him for eating. Now, what exactly does that mean for us today? When, and I, I know I've shared this in, in other contexts when I've, when I've uh, spoken on things related to this, but when we were missionaries in the Philippines, there, this was a hotly debated item, hotly debated issue about whether or not to eat blood. And it was so contentious because there was a popular, still is, a popular delicacy which is called dinugoan, which literally is translated in the middle of the blood. And what it was, what it was, is, was the intestines of a pig that was cooked in its own blood and then served in that blood. Now, you can't get any less kosher than that. <laughs> and I personally... That was never an issue for me. I didn't have a great temptation to eat it. But it was considered a delicacy among the Filipinos. And so that our believers, our grace believers, really would argue about this issue. It was a really hot item because some of them liked it and enjoyed it, wanted to be able to, to enjoy it. And so they would quote 1 Timothy 4.4. 4. You can accept anything as long as it's taken with thanksgiving. Uh, and then others would debate uh, the issue because in Acts chapter 15, verses 28 and 29, there you have at the Jerusalem Council, as the 12 apostles were sending out the, the uh, or, or giving blessing, I should say, to Paul and his ministry, they were not giving permission to him, they were simply recognizing it and, and sending them out, 
uh, it says this, For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep these for, uh, from yourselves, you will do well. So the, there was this debate whether or not, well, blood was permitted because God said all things are, can be accepted, or you have this uh, stipulation for the members of the body of Christ that was coming from the 12 apostles as they were sending Paul and the, and the others out. Now clearly God placed significance in the blood since we know that it was necessary for the shedding of blood to provide for atonement from sin. The Jews offered all types of bloody sacrifices which anticipated the shedding of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that perfect sacrifice for our sins. I was able to find just this little summary of some of the different references to blood and what it does throughout the Bible. Blood was the sign of mercy for Israel at the first Passover. Blood sealed God's covenant with Israel. Blood sanctified the altar. Blood set aside the priests. Blood made atonement for God's people. Blood sealed the new covenant. Blood justifies us. Blood gives redemption. Blood brings peace with God. Blood cleanses us. Blood gives entrance to God's holy place. Blood sanctifies us. Blood enables us to overcome Satan. Uh, my conclusion, if, you've, uh, if you're at all curious, the conclusion that I came to was that it was permissible for members of the body of Christ to eat this dinugoan, to eat this, this blood dish. Uh, and I believe the reason is, technically speaking, I don't believe that it is the physical blood itself that God is referring to in this because you can't eat any meat and have it completely free of blood. I mean, you can strangle it and, and um, or you can uh, butcher it in the same way that God instructs the people to do in the Old Testament to drain the blood out, get as much of it, but you're never going to be able to, to completely eliminate a piece of meat, especially red meat, from, from having blood cells in it. So it's not like there's some kind of magic in the physical elements of, of the blood itself. I believe that what, what um, God is referring to here is more of the ceremonial aspect of blood being offered as a sacrifice. And therefore, uh, the, this dinugoan was just being prepared in a very normal way. As a matter of fact, they, they slaughtered the pig very much in line with the same way that the uh, Jews were expected to do it. Now, they would never slaughter a pig, but they did drain the blood by cutting the neck. And so uh, I do believe, did believe that and told uh, the believers there from my, giving my perspective that I felt it was ex uh, acceptable for members of the body of Christ to do that, that these restrictions were more with regard to the ceremonial uh, use of, of blood for sacrifices and for the, the worship either of God in the Old Testament or of pagan worship as it was used in, uh, in the New Testament and among the believers there, and maybe even in some uh, some context today. And so I don't see an absolute prohibition from eating this blood or these blood dishes for members of the body of Christ. So if you ever go to the Philippines and somebody gives you a big dish of dinugoan, dig in. So <laughs> enjoy. Yeah. Or if you want to go back and eat your blood sausage because you've been feeling guilty about that all of these years, you can still do that as well. Now the most significant comment in this passage is where God institutes the principle of capital punishment when someone commits murder. Now, prior to this, the only example of meeting out of justice was done by God himself. When Cain killed Abel, it was God who took care of the judgment against Cain, who dealt with it. From this point on, it becomes the responsibility of humans to judge and punish those who commit crime. It's because of this command that many Bible scholars have identified this as a new commandment, which they, or a new dispensation, which is called human government. Uh, Schofield has this to say about it. Its distinctive feature, the, the new dispensation, is the institution for the first time of human government, the government of man by man. The highest function of government is the judicial taking of life. All other governmental powers are implied in that. Now, once again, I do not see this as a unique dispensation. I don't see a fundamental difference between how man approached God with this. But it clearly marks a major change in how man was to react to his fellow man. 
This commandment gives the authority for humans, through government, to take the life of another person if that person deliberately takes the life of someone else, if, if they commit murder. The reason that God gives for this is because man is created in the image of God. When someone takes another person's life, he is violating the principle of that person being of infinite value because of him being created in the image of God. Because the person whose life was taken is in God's image. The person who takes that life is violating that principle, violating really God's statement about his infinite value as a human being. And therefore, the only just punishment for that is for that person to pay with his own life. And therefore, we have the institution of capital punishment. This, by the way, is an example of what we might call horizontal truth. Remember I talked about the, the dietary laws were vertical truth. You had uh, the fruits and vegetables at, uh, in the garden and after the garden. You had any meat at the time of Noah. You had the restrictions for the Israelites of just certain types of food. And then you have it returning to any, any meat. Those were vertical truths. They changed as God's dispensational requirements changed. Here is an example of a horizontal truth. This is something that is universal from the beginning to the end. At the very beginning, God announced that man was created in his image. And that principle of universal human dignity and value is one then that transcends all of the dispensations and is carried throughout all of the, this, this, these time frames. And so th that being the case, this idea then is that there are certain truths in God's word that do not change. The nature of God is universal. It is horizontal, so to speak. It goes from one end of, God, of eternity until the, uh, eternity past or to eternity future. Now, I've emphasized the concept of human beings being created in the image of God several times throughout this series of messages because it is here that God introduces the idea and establishes the principle of human dignity. It is a principle that most Western societies adhere to, despite the fact that we in the West have become so secularized and abandoned this scriptural foundation for our worldview. It is still the basis of why we hold the idea of universal human rights so important to us. It comes from our Judeo-Christian understanding of the universal uh, dignity of man because all of man are created in the image of God. If you didn't believe that, there would be no reason to believe that, that all of us have dignity and all of us have value. Those that are, more, um, that are able to do more, those that are maybe have more money, those are of more noble birth, they would be more valuable than, than someone else. But because, uh, because God has proclaimed that there is universal human dignity, we recognize that throughout the West for the most part. Even though the, uh, our societies and our cultures have denied the scriptural foundation for where we get those ideas. Now that having been said, for the same reason that God instituted the death penalty because humans were created in the image of God is also a reason for it to be used infrequently and judiciously. In the law of Moses, God elaborates more on how judgment is to take place. He establishes a rule that a person should not be found guilty of a crime unless there are at least two or more witnesses. One witness shall not rise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he commits, but by the mouth of two or three witnesses, the matter shall be established. The idea here is that the evidence must be indisputable. This means that there should be at least two eyewitnesses to the incident, not just DNA evidence or fingerprints or ballistic tests, but humans who with their own eyes saw the incident take place. And this is the reason why we have these long, drawn-out court processes, to ensure that, as best as possible, justice is being served. Unfortunately, most of us, most people, the court of public opinion, is done as soon as that mugshot is posted on the Internet. You hear the story, and they see it, you show a picture of it. Most of us just assume that guy is guilty. Fry him in the electric chair as soon as you can. However, mere accusation and arrest is not enough with which to convict a person. And if the government takes the life of an innocent person without sufficient evidence, then it only doubles the injustice, because the person who was murdered is not vindicated, 
and an innocent individual also created in God's image has his life unjustly taken as well. And therefore, when the government uses this principle of capital punishment, it should be done very judiciously. It should be done very carefully. Uh, in my years in prison ministry, I saw a lot of, of injustice that took place. It wasn't the majority, and the vast majority of people that were incarcerated were there because they deserved to be, but it also was not uncommon for people to be falsely accused. And so if you are going to take that person's life, you better be sure that they have, in fact, committed that crime. And therefore, uh, capital punishment, while it is permitted by God, it is something that should be used very carefully. Then we go on to read the rest of the story about Noah. Noah's story, like so many of the great heroes in the Bible, ends on a sad note. Now keep in mind, in the New Testament, Noah is described as an example of faith. He's called a preacher of righteousness, and he is held up as a model that Christians should emulate. But we read likewise that Noah was 100% human and as much a part of the same fallen race of Adam as you and I. We read as we go in uh, chapter 9 that Noah became a farmer and planted a vineyard. He enjoyed the fruit of his labor a little too much, and he made wine out of the grapes. He got drunk, and he embarrassed himself by passing out stark naked in his tent. Now, it's a sad thing that the last recorded event in the life of this person who was singled out among all of mankind as a righteous man to carry on the, the line of humanity, that it ends with this humiliating incident. Now, regardless of one's opinion about Christians consuming alcohol, there is no question that drunkenness is forbidden for the people of God. I started college in 1977, which at that time the drinking age was 18. I went to a branch of the University of Wisconsin that was especially known as a party school. The county, as a matter of fact, Portage County that the, in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, uh, was at that time had the highest rate of alcoholism in the country. Now, all of these young kids going off to college for the first time, away from the watchful eyes of their parents, were eager to test the waters of their newfound freedom by getting ridiculously drunk every weekend. So every weekend, it was always interesting to see what kind of outrageous behavior was going to take place. So in my particular dorm, which also had a reputation of being one of the worst uh, in the whole campus, of a campus that had a bad reputation as it was, every Friday night, and I'm talking every Friday night, somebody would come through and they would knock out all the fluorescent lights in the hallway. And so we would be sitting in the dark that because there were no windows in, you know, these were these old cinder block buildings that were built in the 60s. There, there, you were in the dark until the uh, custodians came back on Monday to replace all of those fluorescent lights, you know, the long, the long skinny ones that they used to have. And likewise, uh, there usually would be somebody that would tear the sinks off the walls in the bathroom or that they would break down the stalls and the toilets. And of course, there was always the obligatory pile of vomit somewhere in the hall. And so this was how people behaved. This was the way they expressed their freedom as they had that opportunity. Well, God gives us some instructions in the book of Proverbs about the perils of drunkenness. It says, who has woe, who has sorrow, who has contentions, who has complaints, who has wounds without cause, who has redness of eyes, those who linger long at the wine, those who go in search of mixed wine. Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent, it stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, or like one who lies at the top of the mass, saying, They have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? I had a client um, in my job who at one point in his life had been a very heavy drinker and has since stopped. And one time when I was with him during one of our appointments together, he got a call from some of his friends who were invited inviting him to go out, and he declined that invitation. And he was explaining to me 
that now that he's sober, there's really no joy or fun in going and doing this because what you do is you sit around and you're watching them as they start to do, as they become drunker and drunker, more ridiculous and outrageous things, and you become embarrassed for them. Well, we see this is what happened with Noah. Basically, he had taken the wine that he had produced, that he was able to grow, uh, create from the, wine, the grapes that he had grown, had gotten just stinking drunk, was absolutely naked, and fell asleep in his tent. So while Noah was in this drunken stupor, his middle son Ham walked in on him and found him naked. Apparently Ham's son, youngest son Canaan, was also with him when this took place. Now if you look in the commentaries about this incident in the Bible, there is all types of speculation about what took place. Now simply reading the text, it seems that Ham happened to walk into Noah's tent while he was sleeping off this drunken stupor. But Everybody looks at this and says, well, there has to have been more than this for all of these things to have taken place uh, subsequent to what we read when, when Ham saw his father. Some have suggested that Ham or Canaan violated Noah in some way. Some have suggested that perhaps Ham was gazing or he lingered his gaze too long uh, because in the Mosaic law it's forbidden to look on the nakedness of one's parents. Still, other commentators suggest that what he did was when he went out and told his brothers, Shem, Shem and Japheth, that he was mocking them. He says, you know, look at the old man in there. He's drunk and naked and was making fun of him. To be honest, we don't know what actually happened. We do read, however, that the two other brothers were very careful to cover Noah so as not to see his naked body. They went in after Ham, had saw him lying there, and it said they backed in and they covered his body so as not to see his nakedness. Then we read about after Noah getting up, he pronounces these curses on Ham, or Canaan actually, the, the, who is the son of Ham. We'll see that in, the, in chapter 10 in the, um, in the genealogies of his sons. He pronounces this curse on Canaan, and he pronounces blessings on Shem and Japheth, his other two sons. Now, sadly, the curse pronounced on Canaan, the son of Ham, and the blessings on Shem and Japheth have resulted in horrendous justification for racism and views of racial superiority throughout the ages. When Noah learned that Ham and or Canaan had seen him while he was sleeping, lying naked in his tent, he blurted out a curse on Canaan, the son of Ham. We'll just look at this passage here. Um, Genesis chapter 9, uh, and it says, um, I'll just start with verse 20. We'll read the whole context here. And Noah began, began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah awoke from his wine and drew what his younger, and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, the servant of servants, he shall be to his brethren. A servant of servants, he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. And so as I said, uh, these, these comments here have been used throughout history to justify uh, a tremendous amount of injustice. That... Uh, this is a, a general outline, and this we know from chapter 10, the next chapter, where these various descendants geographically settled. And because the curse was placed on Ham, who generally were the African races, not exclusively generally, uh, it has been, that has been used as a justification for the enslavement of Africans, of black Africans uh, throughout history. And so... Uh, when Noah learned that Ham or Canaan had seen him while he was asleep, lying naked, he blurted out this curse, and he also blessed the God of Shem, and he said that Japheth's descendants would be enlarged. Now this has been understood to be a prophecy by Noah that all of Ham's descendants, 
who based on the list of descendants represents the black races of Africa should become slaves. In previous centuries, it was the justification that enslaved the Africans and supported the European empires. The statement that Japheth would be enlarged was, was then used by the Europeans to, to expand their, their empires because the descendants of Japheth were, generally speaking, the European nations. And likewise, it has been said that the descendants of Shem had a special spirituality because of this blessing. Blessed be the God of Shem, and that it's been pointed out that all the major religions would somehow uh, come from the, the descendants of Shem, uh, not just Judaism, uh, but also even the Eastern religions are, have the, the descendants of Shem uh, as their founders in one way or another. That's, that's the way it has been explained. And that this was in some way a divinely inspired prophecy. I looked at several commentaries, and all of them see this as a divine prophecy uttered by Noah, interestingly enough. Schofield, who generally I respect uh, Schofield and his opinions, says this about them, talking about the uh, curse on, on uh, Ham, says it is a prophetic declaration is made that from Ham will descend an inferior and servile posterity. And then about Shem, a prophetic declaration is made that Shem will have a particular relation to Jehovah. All divine revelation is through Semitic men, and Christ after the flesh descends from Shem. And Japheth, a prophetic declaration is made that from Japheth will descend the enlarged races. Government, science, and art, speaking broadly, are and have been Japhetic, so that history is an indisputable record of the exact fulfillment of these declarations. Well, in reality, this reflects a horribly ethnocentric interpretation, and it's really based on the rise of the European empires at that time. Uh, really, it was a bunch of uh, dead white men who were writing these, these commentaries. Uh, and uh, it, was, um, it, it, was, it was really based on what they were seeing. And you have to keep in mind, Schofield, for example, he fought in the Civil War. He was, a, uh, he, was a, um, he was a soldier for the Confederacy during the Civil War. And so one could see where he may have come up with some of these ideas. He was interpreting the scriptures through his own ethnocentric perspective at that time. Those, mo most of those commentaries that I was referring to were at a time when the European empires were, had expanded to their, their greatest. You had the British Empire, the French, and, and uh, several other nations that were uh, that control different parts of the world, and, and much of the African, uh, or, or many of the slaves in the world at that time were, were still, they were Africans and they were still enslaved during that time. And it's all because they see this passage as some kind of legitimacy and some kind of prophetic and divine uh, prophecy about these nations. But as I was looking at this passage, and this is where I have to say, I disagree with everything that I read about that. I do not see that as the case. I do not see anything in the text that would indicate that Noah's statements were in any way inspired of God and are to be considered an actual prophecy. Rather, what I see them as is a rant from a cranky 600-year-old man with a bad hangover. And he was just really mad that he was seen naked by his son Ham, and he made these statements. And rather than it being some kind of prophecy and we are to try to see how it was fulfilled in history, we should be seeing it as an indication of Noah's humanity, of, no, of, of how Noah was, was faulty and how Noah was frail and how he, his humanity was so real here, that he was shouting out these curses on his son because his son was the one who caught him in his own foolishness. And, and so, uh, as I said, that disagrees with every, literally every commentary. Every commentary I saw, read saw this as some kind of prophecy that we should be trying to find its fulfillment. Uh, I personally did not see it that way. I just see it as Noah's ranting because of, uh, of what had taken place. Now, Noah had moments of profound spiritual maturity, and yet he was capable of great failure, demonstrating how deeply flawed he was. He was used by God to preserve humanity. He was selected out of all of humanity because he was a righteous man. 
that ultimately he was, he was someone that had a heart for God. But like all of us, he had a flawed human nature. He was, he was still a descendant of Adam after the curse. And as a result of that, Noah, just like all of us, was in need of grace. We can see this in almost every example in the scriptures, where you see the, these great men of God who did wonderful and exciting and marvelous things for the glory of God, but yet we still see their flaws. David, Abraham, Moses, I mean, the, the list goes on and on and on. You see that, that God's grace and his mercy extended to everyone. Noah was not unique or special in that. He was a very flawed human being who needed the grace of God just as every one of us needs the grace of God daily. We need to trust in his grace because we too are flawed. Even though we have been saved by his grace, even though we have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we still battle with the flesh. And those of you that have been attending John's uh, Sunday school classes, that's where this has been pointed out, that we still have this ongoing battle with the flesh that we were, will continue to have until the day that we, that we see the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. The story of the flood and of Noah is one of God's justice and mercy. He preserved mankind through one family. Noah was a faithful servant of God, but we see that he was still human. Noah needed grace, and God extended it to him just as he extends it to us on a daily basis. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this story of Noah. We thank you for the reality we see that Noah, Noah while he was a, a man who loved you, a man who was in many ways righteous, yet he was still flawed. And that just as he needed your grace, we likewise need to rely upon your grace. There is none righteous, no, not one. But we praise the Lord that, by, through, the, that through the the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, through our death, his death, burial, and resurrection, we can become children of God, and we can be pure and righteous in your sight, not on our own merit, but based on the merit of our Savior. Now may the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the peace and communion of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore.